My name is Yanis Nasias, and this is the According to John podcast. Hi everybody, today I'm speaking with Father Patrick. Um, welcome. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we will speak about the papacy today. Uh, it's a, top, a big topic and um, a topic that um, sometimes uh, can uh, stir up some feelings. Um, but uh, we will do it um, as professionally as we can. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a topic that um, I, I don't know a lot about. To be honest, uh, I know some things. I have done some courses, and uh, from the general experience of talking to Catholics and being Orthodox. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to your knowledge. And um, so, also one thing before we start, I want to say is that you know, uh, I have a Patreon account. Uh, you can go to my about page on YouTube to find it, or I will also post it uh, below later. Um, but uh, okay, but let's start. So maybe we can start by you giving a brief introduction uh, about yourself. Uh, where you born into the Orthodox Church? What is your educational background, and so forth? Right. Well, I'm, I'm Father Patrick, or uh, in this world it's called John Ramsey, which is my, where I was born. And um, I wasn't, I was born into a sort of Presbyterian family. So I, I, I wasn't born into an Orthodox family. I was born in New Zealand, so far away from any Orthodox churches. Um, and so it wasn't until my mid twenties where I started to read about Orthodox uh, theology and interests. I was having a lot of um, questions and, and concerns of what I saw in Protestant and even Roman Catholic, none of them seemed to provide the right answer for how to understand faith, salvation, eternity, and all these sort of questions or metaphysical questions. And then I read a book on orthodoxy and it basically answered all the questions of big positive ticks. <laughs> so I thought to become orthodox, but then I had to go, oh, there's no orthodox church here. So I had to move up to another city and I found an Orthodox church and I fell in love with the uh, icons and all of the worship, but there was no one who could speak English. <laughs> so I had to move yet again to another city <laughs> and, and was catechized by a priest who studied in Thessaloniki um, from Indonesia. He's now a missionary in Indonesia, Father Chrysostomus, and he catechized me in English's third language. And <laughs> sort of I was baptized in New Zealand um, way back in 1996. Um, and So since then, I've ended up being ordained in New Zealand at the time um, as a presbyter by Metropolitan Amphilochius. He was from the island of Rhodes, Um, very holy man, so I was really honoured to have him um, ordained me as a a presbyter. Um, But then I moved to the UK, and since then I have been released from the the, the Diocese of New Zealand and now serve um, in the Russian Church abroad in, in, in the UK. Um, specifically under their Western Rite, where um, we use the ancient rites of um, Britain before the schism from about 800 AD, um, 700, 800 AD. So we're trying to keep alive the Orthodox tradition as it was received in, the, in Britain from, from the ancient days from our fathers here. Um, and then I, for study, I, I did a science degree and I went on to do a law degree. Um, I've completed both of those. Then, then I wanted to sort of move into ministry as a Protestant at that stage. Um, but as I was stepping to move into a Protestant ministry, that's when I became Orthodox. And then it was not a few years later until I became a, um, a priest. Uh, but just before that, I managed to find an Orthodox master's degree in theology in the UK. So I did my master's degree, did well at that. And then I got permission to do my PhD in the UK and I did my PhD what I call the place of St Peter so it's about the hierarchy of the church there's a theory behind a hierarchy as such which has a lot of implications for the role of um, the, the papacy or metropolitans of bishops 
and the whole and even families and the husband and wife is it's a whole structure of the hierarchy but it, it it talks i call it the place of saint peter because it's a place of christ um as a um being present and human um person persons um in various um mysteries super mysteries and it, and with that person is owed an obedience as to owed to god or owed to christ and then the other person who to whom the obedience is given returns love and protection and all these other things just to, as christ so in this way we come to union with with god through these relationships um yes and so that does a, uh, speak to the the papacy and it, it's its place um so that's what i did my phd on and since then, I just sort of work from home and various tasks, and I'm a tutor at the Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies as well. Um, and so it's my bread and butter, such. And my PhD has been I've published as a book, and uh, my master's thesis too. So you know, there you go. Great, thank you. Um, so when we are trying to deal with this topic, um, what? Let me first ask you a broader question. Where, where do you think we should begin? Because there are so many factors here, uh, historical, theological, and um, maybe cultural. Um, where do you think we should begin um, to evaluate this question? And I, I ask this because I know there are many Protestants that are looking today to see if they feel more at home with in the Orthodox Church or in the Catholic Church. And the question about the papacy usually is the biggest stum stumbling block and they're trying to figure out, figuring out what is true, who is telling the objective reality here. So wh where, do you, where do we begin? Um, hmm, good question. <laughs> oh, when I did my PhD began with the earliest fathers so you've got the scriptures and you can look at matthew 16 and the promise to peter and, and the relationship between the apostles with each other and then you look at the, some of the earliest fathers like some ignatius of antioch um st cyprian of carthage um st irenaeus leon and these now so we had some um unstable internet on my part so sorry for that and uh Let's continue uh, where we were. Right. Um, yes, so we're talking about the different fathers, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Cyprian of Carthage, St. Irenaeus of Leon, and they start talking about the, the church. And St. Ignatius of Antioch is very good because in his letters, he, he talks about the church as being identified around the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons in each place. And he says, nothing can be called the Catholic Church or called the church even, apart from these. So you quickly see, and then you, that uh, the idea or concept of a church is around each bishop and each place in each city. And this fits well with the sense that the, the church worships in every place. It's not fixed to one location. It's that God is worshiped in spirit and truth in all places. And this is represented around the local hierarchy which represents christ and the apostles so like the whole apostolic synod of christ with the apostles around him like you see judging in the um the book of revelation you see christ with the 12 and uh, um, the 24 elders but the 12 of them are the apostles sitting around christ and this is replicated in every location around every city where people gather together in one place the church is a gathering. It's a gathering together into one place for the worship of God. Um, and it's, it's to represent the one body coming together where we are one in Christ. And this is represented around the gathering around the bishop. So the bishop being in the sense a symbol of Christ, the, the presbyters being the apostles, the whole ministry of the whole international ministry, which you see Christ and the apostles globally is replicated in that one location in each location. And the church was being founded on Christ and the apostles is founded in each place on the bishop and the presbyters. So this is really the core. This is the church, the, the, the manifestation of the church. And it's called the Catholic church because the whole manifestation of the church universal is in every place. So when the church gathers to worship, 
and not only is it gathering it just the local people, it is gathering as one with the with all the churches around the world and with those um, the saints in heaven and with all the angels and everything. So it's a mystery that the the, the, the gathering is in a sense a universal sense. So we're, that's why, uh, in a holistic sense, the whole of the church is there. The, the church becomes called the Catholic Church. Um, and so there's no structure or no ordination. So you've got ordination of various ranks in the clergy, from the reader, um, or at a gnostis, if you're in the Greek, <laughs> the psaltis, and then you've got the evil diakon, the subdeacons, and the archon, the deacons, uh, presbyteros, um, the presbyter, and the, um, the episcopal, so the, the, the bishop at, at the top of that um, chain. And there's no higher ordination. So this, so the first thing we must understand is that the, the Catholic Church is present in every place around the city, around the sort of central so location of the bishop and, and, and the press, but in the hinterland around that city. Um, so this is where, where we define. Then the churches have to be united together. And so as we go out a little bit later, we can see in the Apostolic Canons, they talk about national, regional synods. And so this is a group of bishops with a singular head. Who is appointed and for, for the sake of this finding who the fathers used the, the, the um, political structure of the Roman Empire. So they divided up the synods into the provinces of the empire. And the, the person in the, the chief seat, as far as the empire was at that stage, was given the, 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 the leadership. So there's no fighting among the bishops or who's better or worse. So I'm more holy, I've got this or that. Just keep it same. But once this happens, um, this becomes part of the order and the structure of a church. It transcends the political status of a city thereafter. So though it's a, the initial grounding of why you get that hierarchy, it, it becomes the church's hierarchy. And whatever happens to the political structures, it doesn't affect the hierarchical structures thereafter. Except if there's a new city raised to a high rank, it can get a sort of equal honor, but it doesn't take any function or role. And these hierarchs uh, gathered around one C and that, that one C determined or confirms that all the ordinations for bishops. And the bishops are ordained not by just a two or three or something, though the minimum is two or three. The principle is not that two or five or 20 ordain them, but that the consent of two or three or even better, the universal recognition of that bishop as bishop is what's taking place. So it's recognized through the whole synod. There's a unanimous recognition that this person to be ordained as the bishop of this see is um, recognized by all as being the bishop of that see. Um, and so this is the important part and it's ordained by the, the first see. So it, it's, a, it's a universal recognition of the bishop, which is important here, not exact numbers of who, who ordains it. Um, and then the, um, these uh, regional sees would gather around the patriarchs, um, exarchs in the case of an old Roman diocese, which is like a large multi-regional thing, like you had Thracia, Pontus, like three of those covered most of Asia Minor, where to modern Turkey, and then and Thracia sort of went off up and towards Bulgaria. Um, the, so they, they were gathered around these exarchs, and these in turn around the patriarchs, Antioch, Alexandria, um, Rome and Constantinople a little later on. Um, and this, these patriarchs are there to bind the regions together so you don't break into nationalisms and, and things in, in each region going off and doing its own little church. They gave it around the patriarchs to, to unify them in the common tradition. And they had a role of hearing appeals on cases. So all the canons were the same. The, the tradition was the same across all the churches. Um, now, and Rome, being the capital city, was the place where the apostles Peter and Paul went. And they, because it was the first sea, uh, city of, it was, a, it was a city of the world in a sense. In that sense, the Roman Empire was the world. It was the, 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 the empire was shown for from all worlds. So the, the greatest city uh, in that time was Rome. And so the apostles went, right, the first church of the first of the churches should be in the first of the cities. And so they put this in by divine ordinance and, and Peter and Paul went especially there as the first of the apostles to, to establish um, the see of Rome as the first see of, the, of all the churches. 
Um, and this particular relationship, now if you go back a bit to the scriptures, Peter is singled out as being uh, the, the first of the apostles, but also to him was singularly given to have the keys of it. Um, I, I give you the keys to whoever sends you. Then later, all the apostles were given this. And so in the, the uh, actual authority, they're all the same. But Peter was pulled out as a point of singularity, as a point of union. And this is why we see the bishops in St. Cyprian of Carthage is related to Peter, the see of Peter. It, the bishop actually stands as equal as presbyter, as priest, among other priests in the diocese. He's not more of a priest than the other priests. So all the priests are equally priests. If you look at the ordination for a pres the bishop, he doesn't get a special extra priesthood there. He's pointed out to unite the priests, to be one. And this is why he has three special jobs of ordination, uh, consecrating altars, and in the old days, um, consecrating the myrrh used for chrism um, and healing. But now the patriarchs tend to do that. But the bishop is a proper one of that. And those three things are done for unity so that everyone's on the same altar. The, the altar is each temple is consecrated by the bishop. So they are one together. Um, the, um, each presbyter is ordained by one so that they all come from the same source. So they're all united. And all the presbyters um, can't serve without his consent. So they don't run off and form their own little church by themselves. They, all the services are done in union around the bishop. So he's there to un unite the um, presbyters. But as, as, as presbyter among presbyters, that's why in the old days, they used to say presbyters for both or bishops for both. Because as far as their function goes as priests and governors and teachers, they're all the same, the same grace. But the bishops singled out to unify them. And then to unify the bishops, you have the metropolitan. He was singled out to unify the, the, the bishops so that the bishops, though he has no control or right to exercise any power inside the, the diocese of the other bishops, he's just a bishop like them. He, he's only bishop of his territory. And it's very careful that everything has a territory. Your, your boundary of your control is here because there's one church. You now each bishop is singular and he's singular as one voice. This is a very important consideration that it's because he gives his consent for this. Not um, so he is only one voice because only one man can do it, <laughs> one person. So no one else can't walk in to the dice and do his singular role. It has to be just the one bishop who does that. Um, and so no other bishop, even higher, can come in. It's not like a shared authority, which the this bishop has the final authority from the higher one. No, they are all bishops. And and he's and it, it can't no one else can have that authority because it's it's a singular voice of consent which is the authority, and so the other bishops can't interfere inside the territory. However, for matters beyond each diocese to unite them to ordain a new bishop for each place, the metropolitan has a is a centering voice. Nothing can be done without his consent. So if you want to do the common liturgical rites, if you want to do anything beyond place, move over, visit somewhere. You need to do it all with the consent of the metropolitan a new bishops being ordained. So he, he unifies them to stop them breaking off into to separate little churches. And then the patriarchs have some role. And, oh, sorry, and the metropolitan um, is, takes the place of Peter relative to the other bishops in the, as a regional level. He's a point of unity. And then the patriarchs unify. And now in the tradition of the church, there was the patrine C particular which is associated with Rome as a central point of unity but this sea was in three um, Rome Con uh, Alexandria and Antioch they are one patriarchy sea in three places so that each of them has that singular authority to unite all the churches and this is done to protect the church because unlike this is where you'll find a difference between the papacy and this what I'm suggesting here is that in the orthodox sense, there is no infallibility of any particular um, bishop. Now, God may get, protect them with his grace, and he does help them, and he keeps them stable, but he never infringes their free will. This is a very important part of orthodox. No human free will is ever controlled by God at any, at any stage. So he, he encourages and helps them, but he doesn't control them. 
And so there's always a chance that even with God's help, that they can fall into sin and error and heresy. So he puts three C's that you that it comes to union towards one. So we're not breaking into 20 different churches, uh, which is a problem in orthodoxy a little bit now. We've got the we've lost the central Petrine C, which we should re, we need to re, recover it to an extent. But it's in three, so if one falls, one of the others can go. And each of the ones, if the other ones fall, can carry the church, which is why you see on the Coptics and the Syriacs still remember Alexandria and Antioch. The Indians in India, for example, still honor the patriarch of Antioch because he's a Petrine sea. Um, but even if Rome's gone, they still feel satisfied that they can continue as the, what they claim to be the church around the Petron Sea of Antioch or Alexandria. Um, so these, these continue that sense of the Petron grace. So yeah, so, so the Sea of Peter is in those three. Rome takes the first place again to represent we have one, one church. We're not three churches, there is one. So he takes still first place amongst them as a point of unity. Um, but yeah, so that's the structure. And then along came Constantinople a little bit later. And because it was considered to be New Rome, um, the father said, oh, you're Rome. This is the same city as that one. Therefore, the bishop has the same prerogatives. They belong to the city. They belong to the throne. They don't belong to This is why um, the bishops don't all their successor. They're ordained by other bishops because, and they inherit the throne of the city. And so the, the prerogatives belong to the city. So the first C, Constantinople, gets it because he's a bishop of Constantinople, Antioch because he's a bishop of Antioch. Um, and they inherit the, 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 the prerogatives with the city. It's not because he's some special ordination or power it's given to them. No one else has this. No, they're just a bishop like any other bishop. Because of sitting on the throne of that city, they have certain authority over the other cities. And this was the case of Rome as well that the bishop there but he's still just a bishop so so in the orthodox sense he had no right to walk into another diocese another bishop's church and start ordaining anybody or serving or doing anything without the consent of the local bishop he can't walk into another metropolis and or consecrate bishops etc without the consent of the metropolis so we were uh, you mentioned saint gregory the great and then um yeah we had some internet pro problems aha uh -huh. Right, so I was just talking about St. Gregory the Great and St. Leo the Great protected the rights of metropolitans. So again, each one is a singular voice. And so no one higher can take over or do that voice because it's the only one person who has it. Um, Orthodox ecclesiology, that, that we have lots of singular voices in the place of peace who you unify the churches around them or the, or the, the light structure around them um, so that they are one, they're one body, one church, or one will, one mind. So what happened is, so this is a sort of orthodox sense. And so Rome was a point of unity. So in the orthodox understanding, the churches are united around the, sea, the seas of Peter. So Rome, Alexandria, and, uh, and Antioch is the primary three, and Constantinople is sort of comes in. It's, it's also Rome. It is actually, in the Orthodox sense, it's the same as Rome. It is New Rome. It has the same privileges of Rome, even though it wasn't founded by Peter. So it doesn't call itself a Petrine Sea per se, but it actually has the same authority as Old Rome does. It, it carries the same power which Old Rome had given for, by Peter. Um, and it exercises for the unity of the churches. But it, this power must respect the rights of the other churches to their own areas, in their own territories, their own provinces, and their own levels. So he can hear appeals, he can write letters to everywhere going, what are you doing? <laughs> Where are you going? And listen, in some, some places they have a problem, they can appeal to them because it's the same tradition. This has helped to unify the traditions that you can have appeal from various places. But each patriarch is a final court of appeal. So if you appeal to Antioch, you can't appeal your appeal from Antioch to Constantinople, no, because Antioch is a Petrine C. He is a, a final stop, the final court of appeal. But you could argue that you can appeal instead of the patriarch to Constantinople. So that you can argue, 
well, we've got the same tradition. Um, and so we can put the court case before any of the patriarchs in the sense, or, or, or the reunify ones to help unify the church, to stop the patriarchs splitting into three or four. Um, what happened, unfortunately, for Rome, um, and from about the ninth century, it started to move towards a much more centralized sense of authority. Now, it had been preserved free of heresy, except for Pope Honorius, for centuries. Um, so it was getting a little bit, what we could say, pride and proud. <laughs> and, and it was starting to get a bit more centralized in its authority. And um, it went to a very bad state during the um, 10th century. But in the 11th century, the, the popes coming in moved more and more into this. And they claimed authority over the emperors, uh, the, over the secular rulers. Um, I think there's a, the don false things of the decretals, false decretals and um, the donation of Constantine, which I took to give them sort of secular authority. And this was first manifest when they um, consecrated Charlemagne as a Holy Roman Emperor, contrary to the political system of the empire. And this is the first time where it's really started to divide the, yeah, but it took another 200 years before the, the schism really to take place. But you see an increase in the thing, um, dividing. Then um, in the 11th century, um, Pope Gregory VII, just after the schism, started to make some what's called the, the papi, the dictates papi, where he claimed to have authority to go anywhere he wanted and ordain anyone he wanted, anywhere he wanted. He could have authority over kings. He had authority over, um, yeah, all the bishops. He could make bishops, pose bishops anywhere, however he wanted. So he's claiming effectively to be the bishop of bishops. He's claiming to have exercised full rights anywhere. And this was contrary to authority. This is not our tradition, which is, yes, you are first, you are there to central, but you're not controlling us over us. You, you don't have authority to walk in and exercise the authority of the local bishop in his church and make an ordination without his consent, or the metropolitan to ordain bishops in their region without their consent. You don't have any of this authority. Yes, you can hear an appeal if, if something goes wrong, and we'll call to your help, <laughs> but, but you don't have that authority. And none of the early bishops, popes of Rome ever claimed this authority. Um, and so the, things transform. They just subtle shift from an authority of a central place in the other churches, which overturned the ecclesiology of the church. Um, and from there, you see in the West, um, a much greater centralization. The, the, from Trent, you see all of liturgy has been done exactly the same way. Um, but you also, even before that, you see the rise of the orders, the monastic orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans. These are all based on, so in Orthodox churches, each monastery has to be under its own bishop. It can't go beyond. You don't have monastic federations or orders which move over diocesan boundaries. Each a monastery is in one diocese and that's it it's it's ruled to itself because it's part of the unity structure it has to be under the bishop there is no higher authority over that monastery other than the bishop in the diocese whereas in the west you started getting these orders with these centralized global authorities only under the pope who could allow control the monasteries everywhere over and above the bishop of the, the local bishop and so you see this whole centralized, even the monastic, this is why you get the rise of these monastic orders underneath the papacy, which was completely foreign in the West before then, where you had the Benedictine monasteries, which were just like Orthodox monasteries, monasteries who were just in each place, they were, they were just the same, the same style, or all the same thing. Everyone is underneath the bishop. Um, so yeah, these are the manifestations of a centralization, which was foreign to the thing, and therefore the, the um, Eastern yeah. Fathers rejected that. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, overlook. Um, so how would you respond to someone saying that, yeah, but uh, we have here doctrine development. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, the papers exist in an embryotic state and then through time develops to what it always was, but in an unknown embryotic state in this particular case um i i don't 
believe in the sense of the, the development of doctrine, but in the sense that faith was received whole and entire from the apostles, which means I do support that the position of Rome, Alexandria, and we're apostolic. I don't even think that sometimes Orthodox would go, well, they developed later and, and some scholars and they came in the fourth century. No, no, they were there from the beginning. And the canons are clear that from ancient times, apostolic times, that these, thing, these things are founded as such. These three C's are there by, established by the apostles. But our tradition, which was given to us, united around the, the Petrine C in the three places. So this is part of the apostolic tradition. Um, and with that, you have the, they, they unify them, but they didn't have a right inside because the, by ecclesiologically, theologically, the mystery of what the church is, is around each bishop with the singular voice of each bishop in each place. There can be no de the development over and above this without contradicting that. So no, it's not a development. Yes, we accept that the papacy was there, but its rights were also there from the beginning. Now, it may take time for it to fully express those rights. Um, you can see, but even still very early on, you can see St. Irenaeus early on pointing to the, the honours of Rome um, and as the first tes testimony to the seas, it took the first place at the First Ecumenical Council. Um, though I think Hordos is actually sat on it, it's representatives, they're still honored as, as first, but didn't control anything. And, and that's another very important point to understand about the papacy is that in the time up to um, the seventh uh, ecumenical councils, the papacy had no right or authority to call the other patriarchs into council. Now, this is one of the, the authority, ways you know of an authority. So, a metro Politan can call their bishops in his region into council and their bishops must obey. So, uh, for example, the um, Archbishop of Cyprus says, I want all the other bishops to come to meet. We need to meet in council. The other bishops have to come by Ipokoi, the, the obedience. They have to turn up um, because he's he's in charge of, of that. They can't make a decision without all their consent, but he, he can call the, 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 um, the council. And the patriarchs have their authority in their patriarchates to call the council of all the metropolitans together and say, hey, or even all the bishops, so we've got to sort something out. Um, but no one had authority to call all the bishops universally into a council. And this is why the, 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 the Pope of Rome or the Bishop of Rome never called an ecumenical council off his own authority because he couldn't. Because the reason is, is if he calls the authority as a singular first C, and that, C, uh, that council goes into heresy, the whole church being bound by the council falls into heresy. And so this is St. Gregory of the Great talks about this. So that is not allowed so that the, the church authority doesn't call the universal bishops in case it makes a heretical statement. Because God, though he gains grace as a council, he doesn't prevent it from falling to heresy, their free freedom. But then the only authority who can call the Ecumenical Council is the worldwide leader, the, 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 the emperor. And all the bishops are obedient to Emperor St. Paul says, we obey our civil authorities. And so even the Pope of Rome was obedient to the emperor when the emperor called the council. So um, the Pope congratulated him for not forcing the people to turn out by military soldiers. He was still willing to do obedience uh, to the emperor to turn up. And so that's why the emperor was used. Even when Constantine wasn't even Christian, he called the ecumenical council because he was a secular ruler and had to obey to turn up to council. And this protects the church because if the emperor calls a false council, then only the bishops who are turned up uh, uh, fall with the council. And then the other bishops can go, no, no, it's a false council and argue against it and call, it, and call a new one. So it doesn't drag down the whole church. Um, but it doesn't mean that any, the bishop is uh, the the emperor's he, church control. No, he's he's um, free from that. But anyway, I'm, I'm going on. But these things show that why I'm saying that is that the papacy can't be a development because it actually contradicts the specific limits on the rights of the bishops vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the emperors and things like that for very specific reasons to protect the church and, 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 and to deny what the church is, which is, again, every little group around the bishop and the presbyters in each place, that is the full lesson of a Catholic church. 
is represented through that symbol in that place. There is no higher structure which can be called the church properly. Though we can call each synod the church in some ways, but properly the Catholic church is the one around the bishop and the presbyters. And that we talk about the regions of the churches, the Catholic churches, et cetera, in the plural. We have a, we've got lazy in modern times. We talk about the church of Greece, the church of Russia. This is very poorly done. It's the church is in Russia, the church is in Greece. And so sometimes in an Orthodox talk, there is a danger. We're talking about lots of little mini papal type of ideas around our archbishops or patriarchs. But Quite correct. We must always remember that each around the, each bishop and each and his synod of presbyters and deacons, that is the church. If we're going to talk about universal church, we have the, the universal presbyters and universal deacons as well. <laughs> we don't we don't have that, so we've got to keep them and our naming. So yes, no, I, I, rec, I reject a um, development because it contradicts fundamental principles of what the church is. Yeah, I mean, for, uh, yes, exactly, and for me. It also, because we are talking about here, uh, speaking about the papacy, how it is defined and understood today by the Catholic Church, we're, we're speaking about um, geography, we're speaking about territory. And the question becomes then, how do you develop into taking another uh, territory? So uh, last summer, we had some problems here in Greece with uh, Turkey. Uh, I will not go into that, but you you could almost feel like turkey saying we're developing in taking some parts of your territory and uh, that it doesn't exist that kind of development you know either we all agree to it or there is war and <laughs> uh, so yes yeah and the church is actually very strict on that uh, if you look through the canons the territory is very heavily guarded now there has been a little bit of movement even earlier for example greece was actually under rome the, the churches in Greece, uh, Thessaloniki was one of the exarchs underneath um, the Bishop of Rome. And so it wasn't really until the schism where it sort of ended up underneath Constantinople. But properly it was, it was under as a part of the Western Patriarchate. Um, and then you get some squabbles in Balkans about whether you go towards the, the Bulgarians that came under Rome or we have a missionary sort of clashed on the sort of the bit in between east and west and then they chose to go under constantinople um but yeah no, church, but they're very clear but the territory stays the same that the, the rights of the metropolitans don't so if you're a metropolitan see no one can overturn those seas because once they're fixed they're fixed in tradition and you know, even the patriarchs and stuff so this is where actually the patriarch of constantinople has made it has done something a bit naughty in the um hundred years ago when he raised all the bishops to metropolitans there that's not right because that's actually what he was doing he's effectively ordaining everybody on himself and and denying the rights of metropolitans to ordain their own bishops or the the, the these bishops are done are only assistant bishops rather than proper titular bishops who have uh, no so proper bishops who have their own diocese and, and the central voice so this was actually a problem that's arisen in the ecclesiology of um in the Constantinople um, and also in the Church of Greece. If I may add a criticism, Athens is not the first church of a Church of Greece, it's Thessaloniki. It's, you, you still keep that in, in some ways, like Thessaloniki is still recognized as a patriarch of Constantinople at some level. But Athens is not the first church. It should never be raised to the first church. It's Thessaloniki is a pr primary church of, the, of that area. And it sh should be there. So, so because of nationalism and things like that, they've changed changed it but that it's not very proper because the church is opposed to swapping these head bricks to stop ideas of nationalism sneaking in and power grabs and fighting and then bickering and and things like that so yeah uh, yeah yeah so another argument i hear uh, is uh, but you have your own saints orthodox saints uh, that affirm the primacy of the pope or you have the tome of leo uh, that are, is accepted in the Fourth Ecumenical Council. Um, so what's your view on that? Well, well some of the time of Leo, for example, it's quite natural yeah. that the first C should have the first voice at a council. And I was Peter gives the main speech at the Jerusalem Council as the first of the apostles. But it, it's chaired by um, 
James, who is, or Jacob in, in Greek, <laughs> um, who is the, um, the Bishop of Jerusalem, um, or even the Patriarch of Jerusalem for that matter. So it's his territory, so he chairs. He, he gives a final say in it, and he has his final voice, because he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's the singular head of that place. Even Peter submits to that. But Peter has the first voice at the council. And so at the Ecumenical Council, it's quite natural that the See of Rome has the first voice. It has the first declaration of what the faith is. It presents its declaration of faith. It presents, it comes first. And quite often, it, um, that council in the, um, Ephesus it presented a voice along with that of Cyril of Alexandria, though Cyril's voice is probably stronger in in, in, in persuasiveness authority nevertheless Pope Celeste's um, letters read as well and Ag Agathos letter and at the Sixth Ecumenical Council is also there um, and so yeah and these letters because they're usually written with the help of the Holy Spirit with the help of St Peter are, are usually um, are non-heretical they declare the faith faithfully and truly um, there's no error in them and the fathers say, yes, Peter has spoken. Indeed, this is um, declared the faith truly to us. Not because a letter was necessarily going to be written with infallibly from the moment that Pope's or Bishop of Rome was sat down to write it. But once it's received by the fathers and they will see it and they say, yes, it has been so done. So they confirm it. And then they declare, yay, Peter has written through this. But only after I've read it, studied it, and affirmed that it truly is the declaration. And because it, the most of the council, they, it was true and correct, <laughs> it becomes a sort of the, the lead document of that council. That, it's quite normal, and there's nothing particularly special about that. It's what you expect from the Sea of Rome. Um, now, the, the other part was the uh, about saints, uh, saints. Like the claim yeah. that orthodox saints accept the papacy yeah well again the i think the sea of rome was the first sea it did have an authority it did have in a sense a universal authority to look after all the churches so if it saw a problem in antioch or jerusalem yes it had a right to write letters over and try to sort it out or complain or something like that because it's there to unify all the churches all the churches have one common tradition, one common rule, one, uh, one apostolic uh, faith. And so his position is to make sure or, or to query that everybody is actually keeping that one faith, one tradition, and not wandering off. So we don't have the, this again, a modern problem. The Russian church has its Russian tradition. The Greeks have their Greek tradition. As if they're separate traditions. No, <laughs> we have one tradition, one apostolic holy tradition. The Russian, we have a Russian customs and we've got Greek customs, but we must be careful. It's what's happening sometimes now. Oh, we've got the Russian tradition. We've got, this is not the orthodoxy. This is, a, and the papacy was there to stop this sort of thing happening. And, and so you, we, we have one tradition. Therefore, I have a, a sense of, of authority to write. Not that he could control, not that he could force a sinner, not that he could go and ordain anybody or anything like that. He, he only had limited things, but he had the, the authority to, to write, to protect the universal tradition. And, and also you see Alexandria doing that as well and Antioch doing that to some degree, um, looking around. So Cyril or Alexandria going, what's happening over in our concept? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so, so this sort of, these, these Petron sees, these apostolic sees are there to, to protect the common tradition. And so when they're honored, I would have honored as a patriarch. Um, so for Western states, we've honored him very highly as patriarch with a certain authority because he's the local patriarch. Um, but that doesn't mean he has a certain control of ordaining a deacon in, in um, somewhere in Antioch, a, a see in, in Persia, for example. No. Um, and, and, and this, again, even the Eastern saints, when they recognize that, uh, a universal sense, are not saying he has the authority to go and ordain a reader, for example, in the church at uh, Thessaloniki, St. Thirty, um, the Holy Trinity in Thessaloniki, to come in and ordain a deacon for that. <laughs> No, they're not saying that. And it's these specific rights, which is an issue, not the sense of general sense of authority or universal uh, overlook or anything like that, or the first voice at a council. No, it's a specific 
claims of being able to go and ordain anyone anywhere, consecrate any bishops to uh, to make emperors and stuff. These are the claims of Rome, which is still claims today, um, in theory, in any case, um, which is where the split occurred. Yes, and um, so another question I have is, what do you think about the argument pertaining to the practicality of having one visible head? Um, one initial thought that I have about that is also the, den the danger of having one visible head because uh, as as you may think that oh he can solve this problem very very quickly but he can also you know take down the whole church in a <laughs> with a word um and uh, so but but, but what what your uh, how do you think about that Oh, I, I agree. And again, this is why we have the triple patron C and, yep. and a limit on the authorities that he doesn't ordain the other patriarchs. I mean, you do get a, the odd case where he happens to be in Constantinople. And of course, being the first bishop of the church, if they're consecrating a new bishop for Constantinople, he would probably perform the service. But that, but by rule, he doesn't, they, they are, they are self-headed autocephalous uh, Catholic churches because he doesn't go and ordain them. Um, to stop him having that authority, that control that could bring down the entire church. To, and that's why he can't call them to council, to stop that authority. Um, having said that, there's a limit on the authority, but there's still a usefulness in having the first C for the unity of a ch churches, as I said, to stop nationalism coming in and, and dividing the church into different ethnic cultural groupings. And it's quite important that the church does become local and that it takes on a different flavors in different places because this is about um, humans ruling that in each house, the husband rules his house as he leaves his parents' house to rule his own house. He has his own style, his own rule. This is the image of God to exercise authority. Each local diocese has its own rule about certain ways it does things. Each region has its own rule. That's why it talks about the canon about each nation so that you can deal with a language. We can make it a common language. We can have sort of common customs, which uh, the way we dress a little bit can be reflect our things. So we've got a Romanian flavor, a Serbian. This is all very good, and you don't want to impose one because it imposes one um, ethnic style as well. Because the church can't be divided, you can't rip the tradition and ethnicity apart. You can distinguish them, but each church, when it goes to a new place, has a tradition, but it has to, it, it, it quickly has its own ethnic cultural system, customs around that. And that, so it's embedded in customs as well as a common tradition. Um, and what you don't want is a central seat imposing its customs because then this is what does happen occasionally. And then the, the locals or something, oh, I've lost control of my, I'm being forced to become Greek. I'm forced to become this or that. I'm not Greek, I, I'm Russian. And so you, you want our own language and stuff, but we want to keep the common Orthodox tradition. So the centralizing sea, um, so if you break into, um, like Church of Russia and Greece and stuff, what happens, you can end up dividing the tradition and customs can get totally mixed together and you confuse the two. And you and so when the church goes to mission, it brings itself, you have to be Russian church, you have to do everything Russian style, you have to dress like Russians. And that is what orthodoxy is, or Greeks, you must do everything like a Greek instead of going, no, to a local church, here's a tradition, here's our common tradition, here's our custom which we, how we carry it, but you can develop your own style. You can cut the vestments as you want, like the Russians have your, improve your own style. You can use your own language. You can develop your own thing. So you have local control, local authority, and the people feel like own the church. It becomes theirs. So a danger of a central authority is it imposes both culture and tradition on another church. And this is what was happening sometimes with Rome. They'd send the uh, Constantinople, send Greek bishops off to Russia and stuff, and the the people say we want to have local ownership and that is a tradition that the local presbyter is ordained to the, the, the metropolitan by the Constantinople, but it's a local presbyter and then they have their own local style and customs there and this is really important for human character and stuff um and as i said if you don't have a central sleeve though it's very easy for these to splinter into separate traditions because the the, the local customs get merged with the tradition and, and we fragment. And so 
the role of Constantinople, Alexandria, should be to unify uh, these groups so that you're pointing to something higher than any cultural custom. It, it's something that's universal. It's a sort of, it points to the tradition. It's like the imperial, the emperor, empire had many traditions in it, but they had the central law. And so somewhere like Constantinople should be sticking forward to the, the universal tradition as, as a model for it. And same with Alexandria stuff, so will not become a culturally identified. Um, yeah. And this, this is important. And if as soon as they do, then we had a big problem. And I think this is one of the big problems in the Orthodox churches now is that Constantinople talks about Hellenism. It's, it's a, and that's very destroying for the unity of the Russians and the Serbians. And so, well, we're not Greeks. And uh, you're imposing your cultural priorities over us. We, we want to acknowledge you as the first church among us for Orthodox tradition, but not Hellenism. That's a cultural thing. That it's, that's something separate. And as soon as they became tied up with that, um, they lost their authority, really. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why we're sort of fragmenting a lot, um, because yeah. we do need that central seat to transcend that. But as soon as it becomes part of that, then we, we start losing the, the authority of that and Alexandria and Antioch relative to the other patriarchs who are really not really Petron scenes, they're really sort of ethnic patriarchs, which can have their authority, but they should still nevertheless keep some remembrance of the Patrine Seas, uh, that of Constantinople, Constantinople having the equal authority of being Rome and Alexandria and Antioch as the first three, and Jerusalem with them as being the, the mother church of all the churches. Um, so, yes, yes. The, the, we need that, but we need the balance. <laughs> yes, I think you have uh, spoken very uh, wisely and uh, I think uh, all Orthodox um, would agree with you here. Um, so one, just, I don't know if this is correct because it's a thought I had, but when they're speaking about, uh, when the Catholic Church speaks about the, the importance of having one uh, bishop visible, um, it, it's really not the case because you, you have, because the church is, 2000 years old so you have now what more than 200 popes and they're really a council of popes and you can compare their decisions uh, back in time and so forth so you in in uh, in reality you have a council of popes that uh, that are compete that sometimes are contradicting each other uh, on different topics so this unifying principle really, if it existed in the Catholic sense, it existed only with Peter, but then you had another Pope and another Pope. And even, even if they are separated by, by time and place and death, uh, they are, because we have their uh, letters, their decisions, uh, they, are, they are really a council of Popes that uh, we need to look at here. Um, but okay uh we have spoken about uh one hour so maybe you have time for one more question <laughs> and uh, yes and it's if you if people don't accept that you know we we went uh, to rome because it was the capital city um it was the city of the uh, the ecumenical world uh, when saint luke says there has a comma letter uh, or no, I don't remember, but he, he, he's, he's speaking about the ecumenical world and he's speaking about the Roman Empire. But anyway, uh, if we don't accept that, uh, because we don't want to accept that Constantinople became the center uh, of this uh, empire, so it gained Isa Presvia, uh, the same uh, honor uh, as old Rome. Uh, if we don't want to accept that, then doesn't in a lo logically then doesn't Jerusalem become the really big city? You know, it's the city. The whole Old Testament looks towards. It's the it's the city where the you know the resurrection, the everything is flowing to. Uh, doesn't then Rome or the Catholics need to be united with the patriarch of Jerusalem? I don't know how, how convincing that is, but that is that is a, at least a thought to consider. 
Well, I think there's a the major yeah. problem with that is yeah. the church now is a church of the Gentiles. It is no longer the name of Jerusalem. Yeah. And so the danger of putting Jerusalem first is that it gets too close to Judaism, to, to the, the people in one place, uh, that specific spot on earth, one city as a, as a terrestrial city on earth. And so the church, um, the, the, the apostles moved away from um, centering on Jerusalem. We moved away from Judah, Judah as a race, a human race. You're a member of it because you're born into it. You're, the, the worship is in one place, in one temple on the, in Jerusalem. To move away from that form of um, earthly sense of unity to the heavenly thing, the, the church moves away. So it has to separate from that. And so it honors that, it honors Jerusalem, and it is a mother church as, as the first of the churches from where the apostles came. But nevertheless, it takes lower precedence to the principal sees of the Gentiles. And so Rome is the capital of the Gentiles. It's the first see of the world. So it becomes, for the church of the Gentiles in the time of the church of Gentiles, it takes the precedence as a, as a first sea of the world, precisely because it is the chief sea of the secular nations. It, it, it is exactly because of its secular status as the first capital of the secular nations that, it, that Peter and Paul went there and established the first church there. A, because it's a testimony, all roads lead to Rome is a testimony of all the other churches, but precise because we were talking about the church of the Gentiles and to separate from Jewish nationalism, the Judah, Judah as Judea is a place. But they honor it, Judah, uh, but it comes after Rome, Alexandria, and Constantinople. Mm -hmm. But one thing I must note about your, what you said before about the, the capital idea. The capital was the reason why Peter and Paul went there. The authority of it is the Petrine authority. It is authority that is apostolic. It is by God's will. And so for Rome, it, it continues to hold its position because it's a Petrine authority. The initial grounding reason for it going there was because it was a sea. But that does not mean that we change because the capitals change and things. No, no, that once it becomes part of the tradition of a church where we don't have continual changes, Rome stays first forever as such, unless it falls into heresy or things. And even then we sort of, um, God has preserved a bishop there of some form <laughs> in a sense to, in a sense, show the rock at some level. So it's not surprising that the, 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 the the old Rome, the papacy just continues to an old Rome to today, because at least in an external superficial level, the rock has been maintained there. Even if they've lost the rock of faith, God has preserved the rock of the actual throne as such. Um, and when Rome, uh, New Rome, Constantinople takes over, it's not because it is just the, the capital city. Um, because there are other capitals where the emperors reigned, etc. It was because it was identified as being Rome. When Constantinople founded the city, he founded it as Rome. He made the Senate there. He, he put the seven hills. He, he, he identified it, all the symbols of what it was to be Rome. He put it there. So it was like Rome in, in a second place. And because it was Rome in a second place, the, the, the patriarch, not because it became a capital, the patriarch of the Bishop of Rome, a Constantinople, sorry, takes the same because he's also the Bishop of Rome. So whatever was given to Rome also is carried <laughs> by new Rome because the, the, the authority belongs to the city of Rome as the capital of the empire. Um, and so new Rome must be given the same authority because it's the same city as capital of the um, empire, but it's because it is Rome. <laughs> it's not because it's just Constantinople. So this is this is part of the mystery of it. Um, but it doesn't mean that any other new city capital takes over. No, once it's takes it, it's embedded in the church tradition, and that's why we still honor Alexandria, even though their, their political status in the world is gone. Um, we they keep their place in the church. So this is one thing we must be careful of. Is we do talk about the importance of it being capitals. Why Peter and Paul went there, but. It becomes part of a tradition. It's not a movable thing, et cetera. And some people sort of miss this, <laughs> this yes. point of attention. No, it was good that you pointed that, that out. Um, I asked that question simply because, as I said at the beginning, my knowledge is not, uh, ex uh, it's very limited on this topic. But because I noticed that if you read uh, Matthew 16, 18, it speaks about Iraq, it speaks about Peter, 
it doesn't speak about Rome. So that's that's something that comes in the what I don't know how to say it, but in the because Peter went there and as you said, God uh, wanted it to be in that way. Um, but um, okay, I I, th I have many questions, but you know, you can ask two or three more if you want. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you. I move the gears a little now, but I wanted to ask about the. Um, um, let me see, the forgeries, um, like the donation of Constantine. How, how did that play a big role in West for them to accept? Uh, the papacy as understood uh, by the Catholic Church? Yes, um, I, as far as I know, um, that they, they did play quite an influential role at the time. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> though, I suppose they were just sort of like, well, we've got these and it just sort of swung it, you know, a little more in their favor. I mean, there's objections, they could bring these out and, and um, and um, wave them at the people. And, and that was very hard for them to sort of, oh, okay, well, it's very hard for us to, to con be contradictory to this. So it did have an influence. Um, they're not fundamental to all the things happening, but nevertheless, they were uh, influential and in things. Now, if I, if I may be so cheeky as to point it out, we must be careful not, uh, in an Orthodox show, not to talk about Roman Catholicism of the papacy as the Catholic Church, because the Orthodox Church is the Catholic Church. It is the Orthodox yes, yes. Catholic Church. This is of the fathers. The, yes. the papacy is not. It's a heresy. It, it, it's, it's fallen away. It's, it is not the Catholic Church. But they have used that word for themselves. <laughs> uh, whereas Orthodox, yeah. we must be careful that not to call it as such. We, can, we could even call, uh, you know, the Greek Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Well, exactly. In, in because Constantinople is Rome, and it is the yeah. Roman Catholic <laughs> Church. Yes, exactly. So, um, so we, we I, I like to point this out. That sometimes we, we give too much to them in, in claiming it because the fathers all call it the Catholic Church. Um, and, and what should we call them? What, what's your well? What if you, you talk think? to Athanasius, he says we don't even call heretics Christians. Uh, if I mean really strict, um, so we call them by the name of the heresy or by their leader. Um, so uh, for things like papists. Um, um, I usually sometimes just call them Roman Catholics, or so it's a nice way of, of saying it. Even then, strictly, it's not correct. Um, um, so, yeah, papists, um, or you can call them Gregorians after Gregory the Seventh, who sort of led the, the, the doctrine of the papacy first, sort of Dictatus Papi. He's the one who sort of expressed that particular sense of a thing. You can call them Filiaquists uh, <laughs> and different things. Latins yeah. was a way that was. Well, commonly called by a lot of the fathers they just call them latins the downside of latins is not all latins necessarily <laughs> are not orthodox <laughs> so yeah um, that was a sort of more of a cult way of calling them at at that time um but that was another ancient uh, older way of calling them but yeah, yeah so strictly we, we should avoid calling them the catholic church or um yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's it's for me it's uh, by economy you know um, they call us orthodox uh, they don't believe we are orthodox in that sense uh, in all uh, matters of faith so we mutually agree to know uh, but yeah you're 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 dogmatically and technically right um, so, well i find sometimes that one of the reasons i mentioned that is yeah. that people we say, oh, that's called the Catholic Church, this is the Orthodox Church. Well, if you look at the ancient fathers, they talk about the Catholic Church, therefore it must be that one. Yes. And yes. and so it starts to have a subtle way of affecting the people's way of thinking, that they think that the Orthodox is something new or different. It's not the Catholic Church that is founded, it's called the Orthodox Church. It's, it's this other thing, it's this, this Greek thing, and there's something like that. Whereas uh, to make sense, no, no, we are the Catholic Church. This is the Catholic Church. And to keep that sense of that tradition, the way of naming of the fathers is what is named of the Orthodox Catholic Church. Um, it does start to yes. help people to, to start subtly thinking about things. You're right, it's sometimes in an economy we do it, but that can sometimes be a little bit deceptive. And it's also calling Syriacs, the cops and stuff, Orthodox. 
or Oriental Orthodox, which just means Eastern Orthodox. I, I totally again, agree. There's, there's a mistake. They're yep. not Orthodox. They're heretics yes. because they, they still hold on to the um, yep. condemnation of the, the fourth, third and fourth ecumenical, uh, fourth ecumenical council of the Syriacs, the Nestorian. Um, even if they claim to still believe what the Orthodox do, they, they haven't repented and ecclesiologically and accepted the saints and come back under the authority of the Orthodox bishops. Um, so, yes, we, we, again, th these terms... <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah you want to be polite i don't want to be rude about it but at the same yeah. time it can subtly undermine I, the truest understanding of what's going on i think it's uh, it's important that you bring that out because you know i am reading now the confessions of saint augustine and you you know the catholic church the catholic church or we, we every sunday we confess in in our creed uh, you know, or every evening or morning, um, the ca we are, you know, believe in the Catholic Church. So it's important to to say that because, yeah. So we we don't want to be so nice that we, you know, give the wrong, uh, yeah, ex expression. Um, so, yeah, one thing uh, I'm wondering about that I don't know is because the popes before, they claimed that they were above secular power. So how does, what does the, uh, the Roman church say today or, um, and uh, so, and was these decisions by earlier popes, was this ex cathedra or uh, how does a Catholic today think about that? I don't actually know in specific how it is today. I know that Gregory VII claimed to um, this authority over the uh, secular rulers to be able to things, and, and they went for a part, uh, quite a time as being a secular power among other secular powers, <laughs> um, their own armies and, and things like this. So um they just became another human state again there's all the signs that they had left <laughs> the, the apostolic tradition and they were just becoming another secular humanized organization um which you can see in the, their music their art and their thinking and all this is and their practice is just sort of secular humanism really in a religious veneer <laughs> um and so, but so I think because they've got sort of beaten back by the secular powers, trying to join the secular powers, the other secular powers have sort of crushed them in a secular status and 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 sort of taken authority over them because obviously the spiritual authority not backed up by super strong armies doesn't really carry much weight to the non-believing emperors out there. And so they've sort of backed off this claim and this doctrine and, as such. The only way that they sort of keep it is having the Vatican um, that the stopping secular powers controlling the churches inside different territories. And they do have something where they you can look above a territory. So they do have the advantage, unlike the Anglicans, who you, you look to the Queen as a head of, of state. Um, and a lot of other Protestants have sort of almost tooled the state, um, which is copied by the church in Russia, <laughs> that they became a church for state sort of thing under Peter the Great. It was only very recently they got the patriarch back. Um, so the, the papacy does have an advantage of still maintaining something that is beyond and transcends secular rulers. Which is a um, which is a good thing. I mean, so does Constantinople and um, Antioch and Alexandria carry this as well. Um, but um, yes, their claims to actually really control secular powers that's sort of I think gone underway, and they don't really talk about it now. Okay, so I don't know if you have time for one more question. One more question. Yes, we can one. And uh, that is, I want to understand what does the what does what do they mean when they speak about ex cathedra? Because, in one sense, they say that we need this, that we need the Pope as we understand him, the papacy, uh, because he needs to be the guarantee for unity. On the other hand, some say that he only had the chance to actually decide ex cathedra two times 
other says no we can't limit the pope just to those occasions um so from an orthodox perspective how do how do we understand that uh, and uh, yes that's basically my uh, badly put question <laughs> right, look uh, the fundamentally when we as we're talking one bishop uh, over a church if he fell the whole church would go so but the doctrine is trying to basically protect that and say well the pope must be infallible when he defines faith and morals so anything he says which if it was heretical would cause the whole church to fall um he's protected from doing so that's a, that's more of a deeper principle of it then they have all sorts of funny things about how to exactly define when he uh, so speaks in such a way and it's sort of lots of little narrow constrained things and it and it caveated with as long as he speaks according to holy tradition sort of thing because so they claim that the whole point is that they're claiming to follow tradition by this um and preserve it but so yeah it's exactly so they need this there the orthodox perspective is that yes respiter we're a bishop, bishop preaches and can you repeat means the, in the ancient days when they, i'm sorry can you repeat the last sentence it was uh, lagging the internet oh that's okay the um extra cathedra was about the preaching from the throne so in the early church the bishops used to sit on their throne and preach from the throne ex cathedra and so did the presbyters around them now orthodox can accept that the holy spirit does guide the presbyters and the bishops when they are preaching in a sense they are acting as prophets and this is why in the old new testament you sometimes thought two or three prophets can speak and the bishop and the presbyters doing the homily are in a sense acting as prophets and in a sense they are guided by the spirit when they when they preach so long as they are doing so and all attempts under in the holy tradition and obedience to tradition and, and according to a faith they're not speaking their own opinion as an end in itself um but it's not an absolute protection it's a, it's a sort of a guide it's a help that adds something to what they're saying that can pierce the heart of the of the, of the listeners when they speak according to the faith but it doesn't prevent them from falling into heresy it doesn't stop them if they choose to deliberately go into their own opinions say something apart from that so that's why the fathers say to the, when we preach we must preach according to the fathers we, we don't make up things of our own own will we must uh, preach according to the fathers even if we just repeat the sermons <laughs> it's much safer but we're not absolutely constrained to repeat just repeating but nevertheless we must preach according to the fathers so this is where strong chrysostom is so important we can't preach anything on the scriptures on the homilies which it contradicts in john chrysostom he is a father for our excellence so if we're preaching on any particular scriptures we must preach in the line with what he does and then i think since we're for lactus awkward is another one of those early fathers so we must preach in, in, in harmony with them not our own opinion if we deliberately do our own opinion contrary to them we're not protected <laughs> but if we if we preach and, and think so this is the orthodox sense of of the grace there is a grace there is a holy spirit working in, in the preaching but the roman catholics have moved it to center there is an infallibility that knows when he preaches um he is prevented absolutely from speaking heresy so they constrain it only if he preaches on a certain topic in a certain way <laughs> in, a certain, in a certain spot <laughs> because obviously he wrote a lot of pages said things contradictory to each other and <laughs> and and in different ways and so we take those of authority but we can do it but yeah the, uh, the the tradition as you point out the popes have contradicted themselves um the, the catholic uh, the not catholic the roman catholic the papists <laughs> etc have changed tradition if you look at historically just as a historian and you look everyone calls it orthodox old-fashioned why because they continue to practice the same traditions we practice at 480 680 800 ad there's a there's a, unfortunately we're losing touch of those in modern in the last century things have decayed a lot but until then yeah we're we're known for, for, for maintaining and, and even the uh, cops and the syriacs are very close to us when it comes to actually the old traditions they they basically still do all those but if you look at modern roman um practice of old rome i like to say old rome <laughs> um 
it is it's very it's changed quite a lot from the ancient practices and so they failed utterly in the sense of keeping tradition they claim in faith but i would argue that they haven't done that uh, and yet or well, certainly not in practice and they even define that practice is totally variable they can change it as they like whereas in orthodox no the canons and the practice of the church are also fixed we can't go run around and change the practice of a church either this is all Christ, Christ and, and living action, Christ and faith, Christ and living action. This is what the tradition is, is presenting Christ, perfect, maintaining Christ. This is why we have the tradition, Christ in action. The way we act, we do is, is pre presenting the mystery of Christ and all of various uh, rituals, rites, way we do church services. It's all Christ being manifest in various ways through the different orders, through readers and, and subdeacons and deacons. All Christ has been manifest through these proper way of doing this, the way we worship, the way we structure our marriage relationship. It's all about Christ being manifest in our human relation to Christ. So we can't change these things because we would actually be trying to change Christ. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today and forever. So yeah, in the, in the West, it's just the faith that stays the same. And even then we'd say that they haven't even kept that the same. And all of then is, is just falls down to, oh, well, you stick to the Pope who, who basically decides as he wishes and you just follow the Pope of the time as he decides whatever and you might complain and bicker but really there's nothing to move beyond than the pope at the time it's just sort of like a huge universal cult <laughs> around one leader now um though the, its history of momentum of history does stabilize it to a large degree over in other cults but you can see that even that stabilization doesn't do a good job and they haven't been any more effective at unifying the churches than constantinople alexandria and antioch because uh constantinople alexandria and antioch are not new <laughs> and, and and despite all our fights and quabbles and squibbles in the in orthodox churches which have always been there <laughs> um, we're still in unity around the patriarchs um even if russia is just hanging on through the patriarch of Alec, um, antioch at the moment <laughs> nevertheless there that they have maintained the unit for a thousand years and and quite well so um yeah so this even this claim of rome is is not a, the only issue which i find in orthodoxy is the danger of um national nationalism which um if we lose too much of a sense of strength for Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and we just think of them as national, other national patriarchs and other national patriarchs. There is a huge danger of splitting the church um, because of that. Or if those patriarchs identify themselves as national patriarchs, then they lose their, their place. Um, so that's the danger in the Orthodox. But apart from that, there is nothing missing in the Orthodox Church, which which Rome provided in the first centuries. We, it's all provided through Rome, New Rome, Alexandria and Antioch, and the union and communion continues to this day. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have feel blessed uh, listening to you, Father, and um, I hope we could um, do something similar another time, also, if you agree. And um, yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Enjoy. Well. Yes. This is the According to John podcast. Thank you for listening and I will see you soon again.